Hello friends, I'm happy to welcome you all to this episode of the Thought Leadership Show from Quadrant Knowledge Solutions, where we invite business and technology leaders to share their leadership perspectives in various areas. Our guest speaker today is Mr. Kenneth Peterson, President Customer Experience Question Pro. Uh, so Ken has over two decades of experience uh, in CX research with a focus on combining operational experience with data to generate business insights and global CX deployments. Hello, Ken, and welcome to the show. And thanks for joining us today. So uh, my first question to you is uh, that, you know, you have a huge leadership experience in various organizations. So with that, would you like to highlight some of the important learnings from your experience with us today, especially in the CX domain? Um, when I think of all the years, I sort of split between operations and customer experience. Um, I will say there are two key factors. Numbers are numbers and humans are humans. True. And it's really a challenge to connect those two concepts together. And uh, the reason I say that, I mean, it, for seven years, I sat in a back office. I ran spreadsheets on sales forecasts, uh, inventory tracking, and probably the most important one, labor planning. <clears throat> and labor planning was always about, okay, I'm just going to check the boxes. This is the sales forecast. This is how many bodies you get on the floor. And it's completely disconnected from reality. Sure. And it's disconnected from the human side of it. The human that forgets that they need some 20 products of the same thing because they suddenly were told they were going to sponsor a school uh, event where they had to bring snacks. And so that person that comes in or that person who needs those extra four hours for a job, and it, it's really difficult Um to bring those two together and as much as we try you know there'll always be that balance between uh, are, are we letting the numbers speak more for the experience or the humans speak mm -hmm. more for the experience and i think you know the other thing i would say is you know it's funny saying it from coming from a technology platform perspective but even the best technology platform in the world will never overcome a bad cx culture Right, absolutely. So as we know, uh, you know, the customer experience domain has undergone a lot of changes recently. Also, we see the impact uh, after the pandemic, right? So according to you, how has the CX strategy evolved over the years and where do you see it going? I guess a lot of that would be depending on who you ask. <laughs> if you ask a technology provider, we'll talk about how AI is impacting the experience and it's, it's going to impact the experience. It hasn't yet. I don't feel, I feel we've you know, we've only scratched the surface. We've touched some sentiment analysis and that's about it. Um, mm -hmm. And we're getting some video and, you know, even then it leaves a lot to be desired. Um, and then you ask a provider and they'll talk about how, how services are so much more important. that <laughs> You get some consulting in there. And, um, but ultimately if you ask, a, you know, and then if you go ask a company, they'll say it's about the hiring, the training and everything else, but it's, it's really simple. Just go back and ask the customer how the customer experience have changed. And, really well you know, they're okay. saying the same things. And, and it, you know, like the companies are putting on blinders to it. The researchers are putting on blinders to it, but they're all saying, I can't get the service level I need. I can't, you know, they're they're not well-trained. There's not enough employees. And when I need to speak to someone, I have to wait on hold for hours. Or, I mean, the airlines were really bad post-pandemic that, they just had not enough staff for the problems that they were facing. And, um, you know, so it, it's changed a lot. And then in so many ways, it hasn't changed. <laughs> in other ways, it's even gotten worse. So, so uh, that, that's absolutely true. So with the growing number of channels, it's going to be a lot more difficult because with the uh, um, increasing number of touch points, there is just not one specific way the customer is choosing to interact or engage with the brands. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's so true, though. I mean, these companies are sitting out there saying, oh, we're the best at customer experience. Well, when the customer walks in and says, OK, I want to see it, <laughs> they, they're going to expect it. So true. So, uh, you know, with the new advancements happening on the technology front in the CX domain, as uh, you mentioned about the VAC tools uh, used for the surveys. So would you like to mention of the CX strategies or technologies brands are investing into to improve their brand loyalty or customer experience or uh, customer retention for that matter? 
I remember back in, it was around 2002, 2003, we had probably migrated our last telephone survey in CX. Yes. And, I, and we had one IVR survey, believe it or not, that was going to be transitioning all online. And way back then, I remember everyone saying, yeah, surveys are going to be dead. Give it 10 years, they'll be dead. Well, surveys are still around. Yeah. But I think the trend that we need to see with surveys, it's not, and companies do this all the time. And I'm sort of one of those, I mean, I love numbers. I'm an operations person. The more numbers, the better. But we need more value out of the surveys we ask, not more survey. <laughs> like, sure. And I think that will continue to be a trend that we're going to have to see because customers are filling out surveys that are like a 1% clip. And I was speaking to someone the other day just about this very topic, a, a mar traditional market researcher. And she was saying the same thing. I don't know how valid my results are. Even though we're going to panel, these are professional panelists and I'm pretty sure they're just sitting there clicking on answers. And, and that, you know, that speaks a lot to, we're just trying to get too much out of a single survey all the time. And it's always mm -hmm. tempting when you, hey, we have the customer on the line. Let's just ask them this one more question. Oh, okay. It's yeah, but it's just it's just 10 seconds. Well, if right. you start adding up all the 10 second questions, um it gets to be a lot. And so I think the trend, I, I doubt surveys will ever disappear because it is a way to capture sort of that emotional element. But Absolutely. we need to do better job capturing more of the operational data. Um and the the data that you capture, you know, from online, everything else, and building it all together. Right now, they still sit in silos. And right. the winners are going to be the ones that know how to say, okay, I can grab it from all of these resources we have. We have call center interactions. We have email interactions. We have store interactions, how much they spend and how much they, how much, how many pages they visited on our website, be able to bring it all together and then tie it in with employee experience. And that's where the winners are going to emerge. There seems to be a thin line uh, between the customer experience and customer service. And um, I see a lot of confusion and misunderstandings uh, that are there about the two. So would you like to share your perspective on that? Exactly. Yes. And 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 I, I don't know if you saw the news of the day. I mean, it just got released today. We acquired a firm called Sweet CX today. And they're a journey mapping tool. And it's all about the touch points. Absolutely. And so being able to bring together all those various touch points and say, okay, well, let's look at a map on a wall. And I've always had that sort of uh, that minority report movie in mind where all I need to do is I need to be able to grab on the holographic screen my results, pull that, open it up, see all the details, close it and see that it's green, yellow or red. And then I can move to the next one and go, oh, let me open this one. And, um, right. you know, that's sort of being able to bring the data together in a way that someone can quickly, easily understand not just a single touch point, which there's a lot of companies that can do that, yeah. but to be able to measure it across all these touch points and to be able to grab that information just so quickly and say, I know the problem today I have to face is improving call center, or the problem I have to face today is getting the click-through rates uh, from checkout to purchase. And being able to bring, whether it's operational experience, they're all the same thing. I mean, we, we talk about operational metrics as if they're, oh, well, they're over here and, you know, CX is over there. No, they're the same thing. If you're not, if it's not working in one place, it's not working for the customer. So also I believe that there's so much of data brands already have in their systems, uh, but, you know, gaining uh, intelligence or actionable insights from these huge volumes of data, you know, is often difficult. Uh, and also with the recent hype around personalization and hyper-personalization, uh, what are uh, some of the tools that are available in the market um, and, uh, you know, where you think brands are uh, relying on or um, heavily investing into to improve their customer experience? You know, I, I have some teenage children and I see how they interact with brands very differently. I mean, even, even than I do today, I mean, forget me 20 years ago when I was their age. And I'm looking at, you know, oh, well, I walk into a location, yeah. maybe I'm checking their website beforehand if they have a good website. Um, that's not the case anymore. Now the individuals are engaging with brands on social media. And I'm not just talking, you know, the old, you know, the, uh, old Twitter and Facebook. I mean, those, 
I mean, I remember the brands that took, you know, I'll call them the old school brands. It took them a long time to jump on social media. And you can see them because they're the ones that are slow to sort of say, all right, I guess I'll have a Twitter page. Okay, I guess I'll have a Facebook page. And, right. you know, and they're, the way they engage is, um, it's almost like traditional. It's almost like you you have an email, which still, I mean, if you figure, you know, people were only using email support for the last 25 years, right. you know, where they were using phone support for 25 years before that. But I think, you know, a lot of the newer brands, uh, they just have a, you know, I'll call it a cooler trend, you know, jumping in. And if you see some brands are selling right on TikTok and yeah, I'm old enough that I haven't even been on TikTok. So, <laughs> I mean, like, so it's it's really interesting to see how these brands engage because if they're not targeting me, chances are I'm not going to find their channel. They'll probably have a website, yeah. but it's amazing how many will say, "Oh, just go order," you know, go go follow us on Snapchat, and that's how you can get the insider access to this product when it goes on sale on this date. And I'm like. Oh, I have to add someone else to follow <laughs> if I want to buy this. And so um, it, it's really different how they engage. And it, in, in some ways, it's almost exclusionary. And we don't think of businesses that way where they say, oh, well, we only want this, this business and not this business. Most businesses have been, especially the large scale, the big boxes have always been, let's cater everything for everyone. Where there are now businesses right. coming along and saying, we only want to hit these 18 to 24 year olds that like this kind of music and don't drive cars, which, you know, again, another concept that's foreign to me, but, you know, it's like, you know, we want those people that just don't want to be able to, you know, they, they, they're very niche in how they approach it. And then I think a lot of these newer companies are also coming with a different set of values. Um, when we talk about companies that are emerging nowadays, they, you know, they're first and foremost, their mission statement almost always says something about serving society. Um, and I won't name brands, but if you just go to a fast food restaurant that's been around for 40, 50 years and say, what is their mission right. statement? Well, it's serve as many burgers as possible or something. And, you know, these other, you know, these newer brands are like, we want to first serve society. We want to take 10% of our profits and contribute to that. And it it resonates with the, the these emerging consumers. And then usually second on their list is making a great customer experience. I'm not saying all of them do it, but they have it in their mission statement, which, you know, if you took take a brand that emerged, started 50 years ago, that was never on their list of things. Right. Well said, Kim. So there seems to be a thin line uh, between the customer experience and customer service. And um, I see a lot of confusion and misunderstandings uh, that are there about the two. So would you like to share your perspective on that? I, I think broadly speaking, if you just go on LinkedIn and you type in customer experience as a title and search it, it's amazing the, you know, like you'll get a bunch of customer experience agents, or you might even get marketing representatives, field marketing representatives. And, you know, you start like trying to, you know, discern like who who's doing what. And, and the reality is they're all part of the customer experience, even right. if they're not focused on the customer experience. So I, I like to say, customer service is a part of the journey of customer experience. Um, it, it, it's not to say though that one sits above the other in any way, but you can't have a good customer experience <laughs> without good customer service. Uh, and, and it doesn't always mean it's a human. Uh, it sometimes yeah. means I can go to the website and you know get A, B, and C. It's when you have a problem. It's being able to you know call someone and say, I've had a problem with, you know, fulfilling my order, whatever, and being able to say, I can talk to someone. And, you know, I'll, I'll say it a thousand times, CX is not a survey. You know, that's not what CX okay. is. I mean, there's, there's, okay. I mean, it's embarrassing because there's companies in my field that will say, CX is all about the survey we field for you. And that's what's okay. going to drive your company forward. No, CX starts with a strategy and a commitment to treat the customers right. And then it builds from there. And customer service is part of that commitment. 
So also I believe that there's so much of data brands already have in their systems, uh, but you know, gaining uh, intelligence or actionable insights from these huge volumes of data, you know, is often difficult. Uh, and also with the recent hype around personalization and hyper personalization, uh, what are uh, some of the tools that are available in the market, um, and uh, you know, where you think brands are uh, relying on or um, heavily investing into to improve their customer experience? Yeah, I think, I mean, when we're talking about personalization, it's amazing how much brands struggle with that. Um, I, I'm not going to name any names in this one, but we were sending out a survey to 35 individuals. It was a B2B survey. And I said, you know, it'd be really nice if you could just, you know, there's a lot of questions like, did you use this service? Did you use this service? Did you use this service? And then if they said, yes, you go down the string. If you say no, you'd you don't go down that string. And I said, don't you know what your customers, that it's 35 customers. You can't personalize that and say, okay, we already know what they use. So we can hyper-personalize the survey. So okay. it is a real struggle for brands. I mean, big and small. I mean, this is 35 customers mm -hmm. they were sending it to. Can you imagine doing that with 20 million customers? <laughs> if you're a big, you know, I think, you know, I, 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 I admire Jonathan Hawkins. He's, from a company called Anthrolytics. And he always talks about empathy at scale. That's sort of his take on this. How do you deliver empathy at scale? And, and so all the analytics, all the AI um, are great for making personalizations and recommendations. Just purchase one thing on Amazon and twice a week you'll get, hey, you probably need this. It might go along with this or other people purchase this. Um, so all the, the personalization and recommendations, but really the winning formula is going to be knowing when you have to like trigger that empathy at scale. And I, I've used this example a thousand times because if you're at a supermarket and I, you know, I, I'm sort of one of those, I like the self checkout. If I only have one or two items, I don't want to have to stand in line. I don't want to have to make the small talk with the cashier. I just want to scan my two items and be on the way. However, yeah. if, if, the machine doesn't know when to stop and say, you probably need help. Now there are trigger points. If I scan an age restricted item, it says, oh, you need someone to come interfa interface with you and you know check your ID or whatever like that. But it doesn't understand like if I paused for 20 seconds between scanning items, maybe I need some assistance. If for some reason I got to the total and everything stopped, and I said, you know, pay with my card and then nothing happened. It needs to trigger someone to say, go sure. over there and make sure that he's completing the sale. Make sure he didn't abandon his card. I mean, nowadays mm -hmm. you think of an abandoned cart. I mean, we always think of the website where you abandon the cart and you sort of go, okay, I'm, you know, I decided once I saw the shipping fees, I'm going to jump. It's sort of come full circle where we're now abandoning carts in grocery stores because we scan everything and we think, oh, well. I, it did something didn't come as expected. I forgot something or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oftentimes you can so enhance that customer experience because I'm going to say probably 85% of the time when someone stops after they've scanned everything, it's because they've realized they've forgotten one item. Imagine the feeling on the experience. If I came to you and said, Hey, you've paused for a second. Is there anything you're missing? Cause I can have Daniel here, go run to the back of the store and get it for you and bring it up. If that's what's, wrong and that kind of interaction right. is really what we need to have we need to have that empathy realize that something's wrong and it's really hard to make machines no matter how good the ai is empathetic but there's certainly things that we can train them to do that say hey we've seen that between the scant last scanned item and the total you know it's it's 30 seconds if it exceeds 45 you should be jumping over there already uh, the other thing that comes to my mind here is that, um, like we just mentioned about the CX tools and technologies um, and so many advancements going out, out there. So with that, we also see a lot of conf confusion faced by the brands in choosing the right set of CX tools or strategies for that matter. So what are your thoughts on that? I think, um, I think we're guilty of being successful in our own rights when we talk about technology platforms, because we always have that coolest, flashiest feature. And that's, unfortunately, organizations and, and the human condition is trained to find that, ooh, that's a bright, shiny object. I want that in my organization. It's no different than if you're walking by a store and you're like, 
Ooh, I like that. Oh, <laughs> whatever it is. I like that jacket. I like that ring. I like that coat. I like those sunglasses. I mean, we see that object and we have this sort of, you know, like fear of missing out. So a lot of these brands have invested in technologies that might not really be beneficial for their organization because they've seen the flash. And I, I, I won't name the brands, but I mean, if you took a look at a, a CX platform, for example, I mean, I will say Question Pro, we are about the journey. We're about measuring multiple touch points. True. If if you came to us and said, I only want to measure this one touch point and I only do 300 surveys a year, I'm probably going to suggest that we might not be the platform for you. If you're doing 300 <laughs> surveys a year, you might want yeah. something a little more customized and approachable like that. If your goal is just to, um, I'll, I'll say, track problems, um, that's not what we want to do. We can track problems for you. We can create tickets and red flags and notifications and do the whole closed loop feedback. But we want to go beyond just that. We also want to solve the bigger problems. I call it the, we call it the outer loop. Uh, being able to take and say, hey, this problem keeps coming up, let's fix it. So when we start talking about platforms and stuff, I think the biggest advice I can give people is just awareness of what they're buying. A customer journey mapping tool, um, like we just bought with Sweet CX, is not going to fix your problems. It's going to make you aware of your problems. And that's, <laughs> that's probably scarier for some people than not. So, you know, it, it's important that brands do things like that and think about their whole strategy. Do we want to fix one problem? Are we just looking at one touch point or do we want to look at multiple touch points? Then you need a customer journey mapping tool where you can actually look at it, whether it's a tool or consultation, whatever it is, you need to be able to look at it and say, I can look at this company from a customer's perspective, which is very hard to do, by the way. And I'm a customer in a lot of companies. You're a customer of a lot of companies. As soon as we sit down and we start talking about the customer journey, we start thinking, Okay, well, they start with advertising, we go to the website, then they consider the purchase, maybe they go into a branch. And, you know, we're still, we've still got that business perspective. We always forget the customer who says, hey, uh, Shruti, did, have you ever been to this bank before? How are they? Are they a good bank? We forget that part. That is part yeah. of the journey. And Absolutely. it's part that can't be measured, but it needs to be considered. And right. so when we start thinking of the tools that we need, we, we've really got to start planning, you know, what we want to accomplish, <laughs> really. So you have the customer journey mapping tools, whether or not you need them. I will contend there are some companies that are just not ready for a CX measurement platform. Right. There, are, there are brands that you should never invest in an IVR uh, technology. I mean, there are some brands that, I mean, you can have a dialer yeah. that, you know, it, it routes it accordingly, but don't make a, I mean, if, if you're Louis Vuitton, I mean, imagine yeah. the, the, the turnoff that you would get by calling and say, I need help. And then the first thing you get, well, thank you for calling Louis Vuitton. We're <laughs> going to send you through this nine option menu and you tell me which one you want. And, right. and so, you know, I think when we start thinking about the platforms that people are using, um, you know, our brands are using, they really need to start matching them up with what the image they want to portray and you know, again, the customer experience they want to deliver. Um, you know, if, if you're a if you're a multinational shipping company, it almost makes sense to have an IVR tool. Get the right language on the phone, get the right department on the phone, things like that. But again, if you're a luxury brand, charging, you know, <laughs> shall I say thousands of dollars for what most people spend ten dollars on, then you probably should just have someone that picks up the phone. Right. So certainly brands need to be uh, cognizant and very careful when it comes to choosing the right set of uh, CX tools or technologies as it should really resonate well with the organization's overall business goals and CX strategy. So uh, with this, I come to the end of the episode and thank you for your valuable time, Ken. It was a pleasure talking to you as always and thank you so much for your uh, valuable insights and learnings. It was my pleasure as well. Thank you very much.